So I've been working in, in anesthesia for about 25 years. Um, I've been in Nelson for quite a while. Um, I always uh, find the word um, anaesthetist, uh, a lot of people tend to stuff it up. I remember one of my aunties kept saying to my mother, your son's an anaesthetist. Anaesthetist, he kept leaving out the S. And my mother said, he's an anaesthetist. You know, <laughs> really used to get on her goat. So I kind of prefer the word anesthesiologist. It's much easier to roll off the tongue. Anyway, um, the Nelson Marlborough DHB has two hospitals. And so the kind of mantra that's being preached in recent times is um, to have one service across those two sites. Because well, the two hospitals are quite different uh, in size. One's twice as big as the other, and they're about um, 120 k's apart. So it's quite a difficult thing to, to achieve. Okay, the first kind of uh, exposure we got to... Um, one of these Ministry of Health Quality Improvement programs was the Teapot program, which people probably remember. It's a program that originated in the UK. And so I think we had about a year and a half of it. And it was quite interesting when that came and just how much cynicism there was to the program right across the board from the surgeons, anesthetists, anesthesiologists, um, nurses, anesthetic techs, everybody hated it. And um, anyway, people sort of grudgingly went into the, into the um, programs. And I always remember one anaesthetic technician absolutely refused to take part in any of the teamwork um, things that we did. So it was kind of in a room like this, and um, everybody was assigned to a table. But, and we had to do some funny teamwork things, which involved crawling on the floor and making paper chains and things. And he just sat out to the side on his own table and just refused to take part. So, there's always going to be a few uh, maverick people to try and win over. Uh, I think that guy would still be, still be the same today, even after five years. Anyway, the teapot program, we did make quite a few gains from that. It was the first time we, we formed a theatre governance committee, which is obviously vital to, um, to improve teamwork and communication in the theatre and, and across two, two hospitals. We managed to get handovers refined so that the drop off the patient by the anaesthetist to, to Paku and, and Paku to the ward was standardised. And so that was quite good because handovers could be basically just dropping and leaving to something more elaborate. So that was an improvement. Equipment systems were improved. And we started order, auditing um, theatre efficiency and quality probably for the first time for a long time. Well, as the... Um, Surgical Safety Checklist program came on, that was about a year and a half later. Um, it evolved in different ways across our two hospitals. So in, in Wairo, that's uh, Wairo Hospitals in, in Blenheim. In that hospital, um, when, I, when I eventually went over to work there, I, I found that the anaesthetic nurse was doing the sign-in by herself in the holding bay. So that wasn't ideal. Whereas in Nelson, we, had a, we were bringing the patient into theatre and the, the sign-in involved in the two nurses circulating, scrub nurses, the anaesthetist, and uh, yeah, that was pretty much it, occasionally a surgeon. Um, what I also noticed over time was that we weren't actually using the whole um, checklist sheet right through. So the questions that at, at the end of, of the sign-in about whether a patient should have, need blood products or whether there might be potential airway issues weren't being asked at all. So that was something we had to look at, the Theatre Governance Committee. Time out was done pretty well across both sites, but sign out was only occasionally, occasionally being done verbally, but of course the um, person filling out the checklist would tick it all off anyway, and we'd get 100% compliance with the audit. OK, so that, that brings me up to about 12 months ago and what's happened since then because the, um, there was quite a big push on the surgical safety checklist last year about this time. So in order to make those questions on the sign-in a bit easier, we changed them, really simplified them down so it was easier to communicate 
without having to, you know, the cumbersome kind of nature of the questions, because originally the questions on our sheet were, you know, you needed to talk about was the blood loss going to be more than 500 mils or so many mils per kilogram for a child. It's quite cumbersome and not, not being asked. So we just changed it to, is there, any, is there going to be any need for blood products? Just, just slip off the tongue quite quickly. Any airway issues, rather than asking about aspiration risk, um, all that kind of thing. So we, I think we tried to improve those questions just in terms of their the usability to, to improve the communication. So what I've noticed, um, well, after a while, when I became the clinical director of surgical systems, I realised I was going to have to go and work in Blenheim as well as Nelson because you really can't effectively communicate with, with a group unless you've got some role in it. Well, it's a lot easier if you're part of the team. So, so I went to work over in Waira Hospital for two days every month, staying overnight, doing a few lists and doing some management work. And that's when I noticed the anaesthetic nurse was working alone so, to doing the sign-in. So in order to get some change in that, normally if we try and get some change in the smaller hospital, there's quite a bit of resistance. It's like the big brother's telling us what to do. So the way to get around that was to go and work there so I could build a relationship with the charge nurse manager and also with all the people in the theatre. But also we established a um, district-wide theatre governance group so that we have a video conference every month. So there's wire our personnel involved in the conference as well as Nelson. And that was a good forum to bring up the subject of the anaesthetic nurse working alone in the sign-in. And with that big group in the Theatre Governance Committee, you can't really say, oh, we're gonna, just going to stick with this. So, so having that governance group and everybody being part of it, we were able to, we, we were able to change that practice and get the sign and change to involve um, the anaesthetist and an and anaesthetic nurse. And then actually move the sign in into theatre, away from the holding bay, and so that involved the other nurse as well. So that was quite a good improvement. So it just shows the advantage of having a district-wide theatre governance group and also working in the other hospital. Now, we had to make some changes to the consent form. I think cons the consent process is quite tightly aligned with the surgical safety checklist because a lot of the things that you're trying to discuss during consent are safety issues or complications, they're also the things that you're trying to prevent happening when you, do the che when you do the checklist. One of the problems with our old consent form was that the consent for blood was a separate section, so it had a separate signature, so this is it here. And so surgeons were usually not getting consent for blood for most operations. And... Um, you know, for, for a carpal tunnel or something... You could see why. But for something like a lap collie, for example, there is a risk, obviously, of bleeding and of major bleeding, but usually they wouldn't be getting consent for blood, uh, for the possibility of giving blood for those operations. But we had an HDC case where a surgeon found he was operating on a Jehovah's Witness patient, needed to give blood. Suddenly, he found out the patient was a Jehovah's Witness. So, obviously, the surgical safety checklist hadn't been done very well there and neither had the consenting process. So there was an HDC mandate to try and improve our consenting process. Um, so the solution was to, to get the consent for blood to be part of, to have the same signature as consent for the operation. So on our new consent form, this is just a part of it I've cut and pasted, but... Um, you know, there's one signature covering consent for the operation and consent for blood products. So effectively, the surgeon has to address the blood question for every patient now. That has caused a bit of a stink. Um, I got a phone call from a surgical mate of mine complaining about it from endoscopy because we used the same consent form through the whole hospital and complaining about it, but you know, I always say to them, well, look, you might be doing a carpal tunnel, but what if you trip, you know, carrying the knife and it, it gets 
try and through the patient's carotid artery. So there's always a risk of having to there's always a risk of having to give blood. So I don't I think there's still going to be some resistance, but basically now with that signal single signature they have to get they have to get consent for whether or not blood products might be given. So over, over the last year also, I think there has been some deterioration in standards of conducting the surgical safety checklist. And I think a lot, of, a lot of it is due to, you know, you have this time where you ramp it up, you have meetings with the theatre staff, surgeons, anaesthetists, and everybody gets hyped up about it, and then it's just left to run for a while, and standards start to slip. So with the sign-in, we still don't have a lot of surgeons involved, but maybe that's not critical. Um, I know N Civil doesn't come to the sign-in. We were just discussing it before. So it's probably not that important. But I, I have noticed that even though we've changed those questions about potential blood loss and airway difficulty, they're not being asked at all um, in our, in our sign-in. So we need some way of addressing that. Um, with the timeout, it was only two weeks ago I observed a, a, um, the circulating nurse who does, who does the time out ticking the, the form before we'd even started the case. I went over and said, what, what are you ticking the form for? We haven't done it yet. And she just went, you know. So it was kind of like the essential thing was to tick the boxes, not, not to actually do the time out. And a few occasions, not a lot, but sometimes the time out is just kind of a random thing. I think the circulating nurse has ticked all the boxes and some, somebody suddenly remembers, oh, we should be doing a time out, and they sort of blurt out one of the questions, you know. Antibiotics given, or something like that. And so that's not frequent, but that is definitely happening. So I'm hopeful, when, when I just move on to the poster thing, I'm hopeful that the posters will help address these issues. Yeah, the question about essential imaging, hardly ever asked. And yet there can be some major issues where the wrong patient's x-rays are put up. And as I said before, sign out is, is hardly ever done. Okay, so looking forward now from today forward, you know, what kind of improvements can we make? And I'm quite, quite hopeful that the implementation of the poster method of doing the checklist will be helpful in, in our district. And the way I see this happening is um, I think, you know, with the poster up on the wall, everybody can see what's being asked and everybody can see what the questions are. So you're going to kind of look a bit naked if you, you know, if you leave a big chunk of the checklist out. So that's, that's one bonus, I think. Obviously, the person doing the checklist will feel a bit of pressure to actually do it properly as well. They're going to be in the spotlight. And it's probably quite important who's doing the checklist. Um, I understand the, uh, the anaesthetist is doing the sign-in in the trials. So I'm not sure about that. But possibly the surgeon is going to do the uh, timeout, which I think would be good because... You know, the surgeon, quite often the surgeons appear to be in a hurry and the person doing the timeout is feeling like they're annoying the surgeon. Uh, so they kind of hurry through it or leave some bits out. So I think if the surgeon's doing it themselves, they'll have that pressure to do it properly. And also, um, because they're doing it, they should do it properly as well. So uh, hopefully that will, that will get around that, that problem. With the uh, sign out, um, we're not really doing that at all. So I think it'll be good to sign out poster on a wall. Should implement that part of the procedure into our culture. And you know, if it can be aligned with the, the count or some particular part of the operation, so it just becomes automatic that when you get to the count, you know you're also going to also going to be doing a sign out. So po hopeful that posters will be a good thing. But uh, we're not actually moving on to that until the end of the year. And the other um, thing that's going to be implemented is the um, briefing debriefing. And the way we see this happening in our hospital is, um, fortunately, we have one surgeon who's already doing briefing and, and debriefing and has been right from the start. Um, so I'm hopeful of using that um, surgeon to actually lead the program, and she's already indicated that, she, that she'll do that, so that should be good. 
Across the two sites, we've already had a discussion with the Theatre Governance Group about how we're going to implement it. And really, we just had to make briefing and debriefing mandatory for every operation, every surgeon, every anaesthetist, so that we just don't have an ectopic group of people doing it, but we just try and implement it over the whole thing, and everybody just has to do it and buys into it. And also, we have one surgeon who was ha who's been so bad at organising his whole day list that he's actually had um, the uh, briefing imposed on him already. Um, the charge nurse goes in and conducts a briefing with him um, at 8.30, the, the start time, every week. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, that will work for that particular surgeon and we can use him to also champion the cause. So that's about all I've got to say. I, I, there was just one other thing about, you know, we were talking before about trying to um, influence recalcitrant ind individuals who are opposed to, you know, taking up programs like the checklist and um, ERAS. We actually have that problem in our district at the moment of getting ERAS up ta taken up. And, you know, I think you really just have to point out, you know, the origin of these things that, you know, especially with the surgical safety checklist, you know, being a World Health Organization adap adaption and, and adopted by the, by the Ministry of Health, adopted by the DHB, and you just have to say to the surgeon, you, we've got these huge bodies adopting these procedures. What's your argument against it? You know, it's such a, a weight of evidence that they're fighting against. So. I think you can do that in quite a nice way and you know you can usually win them over. Thank you. Well we've got a bit of time for questions and I'm sure Steve would be happy to have any questions. Steve, thinking of the culture in a, one of our provincial hospitals, it's obviously a smaller group of anaesthetists, a smaller group of surgeons you're much more familiar with each other, you would work with each other more often. Do you think that's a strength or a weakness when you're trying to bring in one of these things? Is it a strength because you're on a friendly basis or is it a weakness because familiarity breeds a sort of contempt and we don't need to do this yeah. sort of formal process? It probably, it probably depends a bit on, on the, um, the person who's trying to implement the program. Um, I think, from my, from my point of view, it'd be a, be a strength, um, knowing the people, you know all their foibles, and they know you, you know the characters. You've already built a relationship with them, hopefully, and of course, it's so important to build a good relationship with everybody, e even the people who are, um, would really get on your work. I think one of the strongest things you can do as a team leader is to build a, a good relationship with everybody, e even the mavericks, and then, then it's they kind of trust you that you're not belittling them or whatever, that, you're, you know, you, that you understand their point of view. So I think that's the key thing. And so that's why you know, dealing with a slightly smaller group of people is probably e easier in that you, know, you already have those relationships built. I mean, if you've built a bad relationship in that time leading up to the discussion, then you, you're starting off on a really weak footing. So I really think your yeah, relationship building is the key to that. Are there any questions from the audience for Steve? Yep, there's one there. Could you tell us a little bit more about the briefing and debriefing? Are you referring to a um, get together at the beginning of an operating list, everybody together and talking about the whole list? Or what are you referring to? Please. Yeah, well, the, the briefing debriefing program, I presume you're familiar with the, with the fact that it's going to be introduced across the country over the next year um, as part of the HQSC program for reducing perioperative harm. So in Nelson, we're, we're actually going to be part of the second group of DHVs that implement briefing and debriefing. Um, so it's still six months away, but we are already having discussions about how to do that, as I said before, with the Theatre the the Governance Committee, which covers both sites. And I mean, the key thing Again, I think we'll be um, establishing a good rapport with the groups that we have to get to buy into it. Um, 
the way the way that we'll probably do that is to get everybody together. Normally on one Friday morning of the month, a lot of departments in theatre are having a sort of um, CME type program, so that's the ideal time to get everybody together and talk about the pro program coming up. And we're quite lucky, as I said, that we've got one surgeon who's already doing it. So a lot of the nurses have already been exposed to it, who, who work in this um, ear, nose and throat theatre. Ear, nose and throat theatre. And, um, and so if we can, if we can get um, the surgeon involved to kind of lead the program, and she's a really good communicator and well-respected, I think um, it should work fine. It would be really important... Um, to get the whole theatre governance committee buying into it across the two hospitals. I think it's obviously a bit harder for us to implement the program over in Wairau Hospital, because um, as, as I said, they're a wee bit resistant to the Big Brother thing, but because we have the combined committee, um, you know, hopefully we can implement it. And what we're actually doing is we're getting um, surgeons and anaesthetists to go and work in, in the Wairau Hospital more and more, so that a lot of people are going over once a month, so becoming part of the team is essential, I think, to try and implement those programs. So I'm just hopeful all those, all those, those sort of three or four things will help get it cemented.